Good morning and welcome to our class. I have a few announcements from the boss who said, no, you do it. Anyway, first and foremost, I'm reading this. To those who may be joining us in person in the HASP classroom for the first time, welcome. We are so happy to have you here. Also, welcome to those joining via Zoom in the HASP virtual classroom. Next, even though she's not here today, you may recognize a new face in the HASP office. That is Amy Weber, our new office and project manager. She comes to us from the US Department of Commerce, but has resided in Holland for three years. She and her family are movie buffs, and they love exploring the myriad of public events hosted in and around Holland. <clears throat> Please join me in welcoming Amy. Okay. Lastly, as we approach a new month, we are happy to invite you to our monthly program hosted next Tuesday, October 4th at 9.30 at the Jack Miller Center for Musical Arts. <clears throat> the presentation is titled, Saving Journalism and Democracy, Even as Newspapers Die. Coffee and cookies will be served beginning at 9 a.m. We hope to see you there. Thank you. How my my name is Gordon Stedjink. I'm the coordinator of this course, and we're happy to welcome you. Our speaker today is Dr. Gerald Griffin. He began his faculty appointment at Hope in the Departments of Psychology and Biology in the fall of 2015. Previously, he was an assistant professor in the Department of Biology at Tuskegee University. <clears throat> Dr. Griffin has recently been appointed the provost of Hope College. That's the, I'll just say the top academic position at the college. <clears throat> Dr. Griffin's research interests primarily focus on the reciprocal interactions between viruses and the nervous system. So that's what he's going to talk to us about for a couple of sessions. I'm sorry. <clears throat> he has a bachelor's degree from Cornell University, a PhD in neuroscience from the University of Pennsylvania, and he has done postdoctoral work in the Department of Microbiology at the University of Pennsylvania, where he focused on how herpes simplex virus type one regulates the gene expression in neuron cells. We welcome Dr. Griffin to Hope, to HASP and his presentation of viruses and the brain. Thank you. Thank you, Gordon. It's great to be here today. I tend to not like barriers, so I will probably not stand behind this podium. Um, and I will probably walk a little bit around. So those that are interacting with us via Zoom know if I go out of the camera, I haven't disappeared anywhere. I've just decided to walk a little bit and kind of connect to different people in the audience as well. And I hope to, sometimes I'm not ignoring you all in the room if I focus my attention at the camera as I like to, again, try to engage those all across our audiences, both in person, as well as those that are talking with us, meeting with us virtually. Um, so I hope everyone's doing well today. I'm excited to share a little bit about my work that I've done here, mostly at Hope with undergraduate students, looking at how viruses impact the brain and behavior. Um, if we do have extra time, if the, based on questions as well, I can share a little bit of my work that I performed at University of Pennsylvania when I was a postdoctoral researcher there, where I first began learning about herpes virology and how it could actually impact the brain. So how does that sound as a 
plan for us to go on. Excellent. Um, before I move on, my contact information is indeed on the slide. I will do this since we have two screens, just highlight that here. Email griffing at hope.edu. Quite honestly, a faster way probably to get in touch with me is just emailing provost at hope.edu. And then um, my great executive assistant, um, Laura McMullen, will find me and we'll create a message together sometimes. I'm also on Twitter. I don't post too much, um, but I do find it as a source of great scientific updates. And so my Twitter is at neurogriff, and that is that. Great. So first, I just want to give a, a, a focused definition on what viruses are. Um, you often see this phrase if you look in a virology textbook or introductory biology course book as well, that viruses are what we call obligate parasites. So in first, we, we recognize that viruses are indeed parasites. They need an organism to thrive. They need an organism to reproduce. They need at least a cell to reproduce and pass their genetic information to the next generation. Now, then we come to the word obligate, which basically means is that viruses can't do their work unless they are inside of a host, right? And that host could be one cell. Um, they won't do much work if there's only one cell around, I can tell you that, because then there are no other new cells to come in contact with and so that it can replicate. And so typically what we mean by that is that viruses indeed need a host organism for their replication as well as for their activity. And so that is something just to keep in mind. Oftentimes we say, oh, like this detergent or this chemical has killed the virus. That's technically a misnomer. Right, so that viruses are not alive. In fact, I remember as an undergraduate, there was some debate in our department of biology at Cornell is whether they should teach us about viruses in introductory biology because viruses are not living. Yes, they reproduce. Yes, they have genetic information, either DNA, um, deoxyribose nucleic acid, or RNA, ribose nucleic acid. Um, they don't necessarily metabolize. Right, and so they don't meet all those critical criteria for life as has been proposed. And so we would say that they are indeed abiotic or not living, but they indeed are essential for life and the evolution of life as we see many viral remnants and even in our DNA that has passed along from generation to generation to generation. And so they're key on how our immune system responds as well as helping information go along from parent to child. The virus that I will focus on is the virus that has become near and dear to my heart and to my mind. It's herpes simplex virus type one. I'll refer to it as HSV1. And you can see that it has an envelope. It's an enveloped virus. And so what that means is that there is a set of proteins and I'll use the arrow here so everyone can see. There's a structure here that encap encapsulates lots of proteins that we see in the midst of the tegument area of the virus, which is just the middle, the second middle portion. And then in the core of the virus, we actually see where its genome or genomic material is. And herpes simplex virus is a double-stranded DNA virus. So it's much akin to how our DNA is arranged in our own cells. You'll also see here on the slide that HSV1 has these, what we call glycoproteins on its outer surface. And there's a whole host of them. Uh, these glycoproteins are a combination of sugars attached to proteins, hence the name glycoproteins. And in these, it is these glycoproteins that actually interact with the human or animal receptors allowing the virus to actually get into the cell. And so remember on the last slide, I said that HSV1 is a virus and so viruses are indeed obligate parasites. So that means if something is awry in the glycoproteins, they cannot attach readily to the receptors. And there are a number, about 12 receptors 
that HSV-1 can attach itself to to gain entry into the cell. And so once it gains entry into the cell, the virus is able to replicate. It will make more and more copies of itself, eventually killing that whole cell because as the virus is made, it's going to egress or exit that cell, actually bursting or lysosine that cell. So now that cell is not physically intact. And so therefore that cell is not alive anymore. Now I'm gonna do something that typically is not done in scientific talks, but I took it from the structure of Toni Morrison's novel, The Bluest Eye. And if you have read that, you know that on the very first page of the book, she tells you the entire plot. And so here's the big picture, is that I hope to show you today evidence that demonstrates that herpes modulates animal behavior. Moreover, we'll actually link it to how herpes activates the immune system. And I would posit, I would theorize that it's this interaction with the immune system that actually goes or is a direct culprit, if you will, of HSV-1 modulating the behavior of animals. Let's just first start with what we tend to know or think about HSV. So typically you say herpes, everyone most often readily thinks of the cold sore that we often think can only appear on your lip or your mouth. And we have that image here. One thing to note is that HSV-1 infects approximately 70% of the whole world's population. Those percentages are different if you look at different demographic groups. So if you look at Caribbean islands in, South America, in some smaller South American countries, that number can go up all the way to 92 or 96% in some of those populations. It typically people think it's innocuous, right? You get your cold sore, it goes away over time done. Some people have one cold sore and they never have another one. Some people often have what we call frequent reactivations. And so they'll get these cold sores or these sores over and over again. Let me tell you, wherever you have epithelial or mucosal cells, you can have a herpes infection. And so there is people who have herpes infection, primary infection on their, on their feet. So plantar herpes infection. Um, Herpes is actually the leading infectious cause of corneal blindness. So if you were to have viral remnants that were still intact and infectious and touch your eye, it actually could lead to blindness. And I actually met a young woman when I was giving a talk at Tuskegee, and she was like, thanked me for actually noting that because she actually did struggle with some vision because of a herpetic infection. Most people who have herpes are initially infected during young adulthood. In fact, there was one study who tracked first year college students to their senior year of college students. Only about 20% actually had the virus first year of college. And then by senior year, you had about 50 to 60% of the population as seniors. Okay, so it's people are in close contact, they're drinking after each other, et cetera, being able to pass the virus from one to another. One thing that got me really excited about herpes being a behavioral neuroscientist, and so if I were to back up and tell you a little bit more about my trainings, that my PhD is, was all focused on how ovarian hormones rewire the brain to modulate behavior. And I took a big leap in learning herpes microbiology, herpes molecular virology in particular, Lily, because I was still interested in behavior, but I was looking at, well, I see how hormones act on the brain, how might viruses or their indirect effects act on the brain as well? And so that's what motivated me to have that switch um, in focus of study. The amazing thing, or one of the amazing things about herpes is that it actually forms a latent infection. And so that means that once it initially infects the mucosal cells or epithelial cells, that virus is then going to travel because now it's lice, the cell. And so now we have virions or virus particles in the plasma, in the extracellular fluid. And it's actually going to be able to travel, travel to sensory neurons, okay? It's taken up by the axons. And we can like point that out perhaps here. 
And then as it goes up through what we call retrograde transport, so from the axon, which is the part of the neuron, which are the primary nerve cells that spike, that as it goes up through the axon, which typically is known for sending messages, the virus is taken up by the axon and it can actually form a permanent latent infection in those sensory neurons. Now, these sensory neurons are not in the central nervous system. The central nervous system is just the brain and the spinal cord proper. Those are the only two components of the central nervous system. These sensory neurons are in our peripheral nervous system. Or sometimes you may have heard it referred to as the PNS. These peripheral sensory neurons allow us to detect things in our environment, right? They're right outside of the central nervous system. So they are, you may have heard of the dorsal root ganglia or DRG, which are just a set of cell bodies of sensory neurons that just sit right outside the spinal cord. Um, if there is an infection on your face somewhere of herpes, then it's going to infect those sensory neurons that are in the trigeminal ganglia like literally meaning, you know, tri meaning three, Gemini from twins or two. So there's this, um, neuro, this clusters of neurons that actually have become these forks in the road, if you will. And so it actually is going to take up permanent residence there for the rest of the host life, right? So once you have herpes, as of yet, I know there are those who are working on a cure, but currently we do not have a cure for HSV-1, and so once you have it, you will have it for the rest of your life. I hear, so I'm gonna repeat that because that's the next, yes, great question. So the, there was a question about well, what, what is it doing there? Well, after it binds itself into sensory neurons, and I'm making that point over and over again, because it does something very different if it ever were to get into your central nervous system. But in a select few of sensory neurons, HSV-1 is able to basically kind of hide out. It doesn't replicate at the same level as it were if it were in epithelial cells or mucosal cells or central nervous system neurons. What is it doing? It's making a tiny piece of its genome replicate over and over again. But as of today, we have no evidence that it's actually producing proteins. Proteins, the active molecules, the active compounds that typically are able to act on the cell proper for functionality. The interesting thing is that even though the virus is not making proteins and it's only making one small part of its virus, viral genome, over and over again. And we can talk about that later because it's really fascinating about the part of the genome that it actually replicates should not be stable, but it is. But our bodies, our animals' bodies actually know that this sensory neuron is infected. So what happens is that the infected neuron here, so the orange is the neuron, this purple is this depiction of HSV-1, CD8 positive T cells, these are killer cells. These are cytotoxic cells surround the infected neuron, which are these blue dots here, the CD8 positive T cells. Interestingly, these CD8 positive T cells do not kill the infected neuron. In fact, if you were to take them out and remove them from the system, the virus reactivates and it starts making viral proteins. And alas, the cell dies because now the virus is replicating inside that cell at high degree and it kills the neuron. And so there's this paradox here that apparently these sensory neurons that are infected need these killer T cells to surround it, to keep it alive in the infected state. If these neurons were not infected, the virus was not here, CD8 positive T cells would surround it and would release their proteins, such as interferon gamma and TNF alpha, tumor necrosis factor alpha, which normally kills cells, kills neurons. But when the virus is present, it doesn't do so. And so oftentimes you may hear some virologists say that herpes is 
neuroprotective in these cells. That if you were to have the herpes virus, you want them to use sensory neurons because it's going to help keep them alive in the face of cytotoxic compounds. So these are things that keep me up at night as a scientist because it doesn't make sense. It, should, it doesn't make sense. Um, here's what we know behaviorally in human data. And this is a group actually with some colleagues in Michigan. What we know is that if you were to just look, and this is a large epidemiological study, one of the national health studies that was done quite a while ago. And what they looked at were people who had HSV-1, at least that we know have HSV-1, because again, the virus is latent. So if there was an active cold sore, or if there maybe was initial blood infection to actually, or blood tests, excuse me, that actually show the initial antibodies, uh, because after that, the virus is latent, you may not have very high levels of antibodies in your, your blood system. So we always go with a, that, that definition of latency that we, that's the caveat. But those humans who had presence of known HSV-1, what we see in children aged six to 16 are slightly decreased reading scores, okay? Nothing that would put them below grade level, nothing that impairs major function, but we do see this piece of evidence in humans. We also see lower spatial reasoning as well. Middle age, we see slower coding speed. So a test where someone gives you a set of digits that correspond to um, numbers or letters on a, a keyboard, typically a typewriter even, and to see how fast you can transcribe the code. Well, it's slightly decreased in the individuals in this age range that are herpes positive. And so knowing this human correlational data, right, because we have not shown causation, we just have a link between herpes presence and these behavioral scores. My lab here with Hope undergrads thought, could we actually determine causation? Could we actually think of ways to determine if the presence of herpes actually prompted changes in animal behavior. And in our first hypothesis, and I will say that's where it was used on purpose, was that a latent infection of HSV-1 would decrease working memory in mice. And so all these behavioral um, scores that I just talked about, reading comprehension, spatial reasoning, coding speed, all work on or all rely on our working memory, meaning things that we can hold at present tense to use them pretty immediately, right? We're not talking about long-term memory storage. We're not even talking about short-term memory. We're talking about recalling things to use it actively in the present tense. So to do this, we infected mice with herpes. Uh, we do a corneal scarification method of infection or inoculation. So what we do is we anesthetize the animals and then we actually put tiny pores in the cornea, which enhances the capability for the virus to actually get into the eye and then travel to the trigeminal ganglia, where we know that if it forms a latent infection, um, that's where it will stay long-term. Now we use mice because Earlier studies have shown that the virus does not that's not spontaneous, uh, spontaneously reactivate in mice. So unless we were to temperature stress the mice, uh, we would know for certain based on previous data from the work of my as well as many elders through many generations that in mice the virus is going to stay latent. And so we know that whatever behavioral effects we see will be based on the herpes presence itself and not an active acute infection. The first test we did was, is called the Morris water maze. And so we put mice either infected or not infected. And I will say the uninfected animals went through the same sedation procedure and corneal scarification. We just didn't drop virus on the eye. We just dropped our, um, this case, our sterile buffer solution as a mop control or vehicle control. For the Morris water maze, you have a pool of water that is 
slightly cool, so it's slightly uncomfortable for the rodent, as well as mice don't like to swim. And so we have a pool of water that has paint in it, so it's cloudy, they can't see the bottom. And there's a hidden goal, a hidden platform, so that if they find it, they don't have to swim anymore. They're out of the water, okay? But they can't see the goal visually. And so what we would do is we would put mice in one quadrant. You see, we divided the maze, which is circular, into different quadrants. And different quadrants would have different visual cues. So this would be a square, um, star, triangle, et cetera. And the idea is, could they use the visual cues to learn where the goal is? And we would never move the goal, but we would move their starting place. And so they had to, we were looking to see if they could use visual cues and imagery present in the room to find the goal faster after trial one, faster after trial two, et cetera. Here's what we saw. So on the y-axis you see here is in seconds escape latency. And that means really it's how long it took the rodent, the mouse in this case, to find the hidden platform. And then on the x-axis are the trial numbers within the same day, um, in fact, in the same period. So trial one, trial two, next, and trial three, and trial four. In red are those animals that were uninfected, and in black were the animals that were infected. And this is a pilot study, so you see here that it was in or sample size of five animals per group. And what you see that on the first day, which we ran four trials, there was no difference between the infected and uninfected animals. They learned pretty much at the same rate. Uh, there was, even though this looks like a difference here, that statistically it was not significant. Uh, you can see on day four, which we did trials day one, two, three, and four, but just showing here day four, that again, there was no difference between the animals. It does, you know, look as this animal's got a bit smarter, if you will, although not statistically different either as well from day one to day four. So we were perplexed. I think our, my students were a little upset because they said, well, it didn't work, Dr. Griffin. I said, well, it did work. Our methods were uh, accurate or, and we employed them just the way that people have done previous literature. I said, our findings did not support our hypothesis, right? So what do we do? Well, thankfully we also did another test. I mean, in this test, which is called the open field test, we put a mouse in a big box and we shine a bright light in the middle of that box. And we do this test for a couple of different reasons. Number one, we can measure animal speed, um, distance travel to see if there was any impact on locomotor activity between the two groups. So indeed, if the animals were indeed latently infected, we would not expect any differences between locomotor activity. And thus we did see that. The one difference we did see in the open field test was the latency to enter the center zone. And so the center zone of this box was lit up and the infected animals took much longer to actually enter the center zone. I mean, the, the uninfected ones pretty much went there right away. So that's why you don't even see a bar or a column here. It was most, it was immediate. They went right to the center and just started roaming around where it took a while for the infected animals. And if you actually look at the videos, if you can come to the lab with me if you want to see them, um, these animals would just stay on the periphery. And so one thing to note is that mice, like most ro rodents, are typically um, don't like light shining on them, right? They are objects of prey. A bird can come swoop down, a large cat can come get them. So they'd rather stay in the dark or stay close to the edge because they were perhaps maybe looking for an exit out, if I can anthropomorphize the mouse, which I always tell my students not to do, but I'll do it for storytelling sake today. And so I said, I think we have something going on here because while we didn't see the impacts on working memory based on latent infection, we are seeing some difference in animal behavior. And this could be explained for a couple of different reasons, right? Well, maybe the the rats just moved a bit slowly, but our locomotor activity data didn't support that. 
perhaps there was a difference in what we call anxiety-like behaviors, right? So the mice can't speak back to us, though they do utilize ultrasonic vocalization, but I can't understand them. So I don't know if they're anxious or not, right? That's an emotional state. So what we say, to be more precise, is that there are anxiety-like behaviors being exhibited by rodents or other non-human species. And I said, let's further investigate this. Um, th there was no sign or evidence at the time that herpes would induce anxiety-like behaviors. But if you think about those tests that the humans have performed, reading comprehension scores, coding speed, et cetera, these were all performance-based tests done in front of other people. They were not drastic differences, right? So it wasn't the case that the six to 16 year old students couldn't read, they just maybe had a little bit of test anxiety perhaps. And so that was our working hypothesis. And so I'm a musician, so I like to incorporate some music as well in all of my life. So I told my students, we're gonna hold the formata here. We're gonna hold this note for as long as it takes to set, design a new set of experiments. And so we revised our hypothesis. Um, oftentimes people don't tell you they've revised their hypothesis. I'm being very transparent and honest with you. Uh, it was not our original one, but we revised it and we said, does HSV-1 latency increase anxiety-like behaviors? And that's gonna be the subject of the next set of slides. So we wanted to replicate our data with more animals and just to make sure that we were detecting a real result. So this is the open field test again. Here, there's again, this open box, the center region, which is lit up and the more peripheral region here. And what we see again, latency to the center zone, unaffected did go to the center zone, but drastically significantly reduced compared to our infected animals. So the infected animals took a lot longer to enter that center zone here. Okay, we've replicated that data. Let's see if there's other anxiety-like behaviors that we can see a difference in, because you want to show this in a couple of different ways if this really is a real result. We also looked at repetitive behaviors. So typically, again, if we're taking animal behavior data and transporting it to human clinical data, those that have anxiety or that are nervous typically have behavior that is repetitive, but is not goal-oriented. So like I pick my nails, I chew my nails, I tap my finger, et cetera. These are repetitive behaviors that oftentimes are associated with anxiety. And so we looked at nestlet shredding in mice. So nestlets are just little pieces of paper. And typically if, when a mother is pregnant, she will use this paper and scruff it up to build a nest for her, pups or mouse pups. But if the mother is not pregnant, and I will, I need to back up and say that we um, use all male mice, and we do have some data doing some sex comparisons that I can talk about if you're interested there. Um, and so the male mice typically won't do anything with this nestlet. And you can see here in the imagery, the unaffected animals, the nestlet is mostly intact, a little bit of scruffing up. Those that were infected, all scruffed up. And if we look at the change in nestlet mass, which is on the y-axis, right? So we would take the largest portion that was visibly detectable, and we would, we would take the mass of that, compare it to its original mass when it was completely intact. We saw the greatest decrease in nestlet mass in those animals that were infected. One thing to note that our ends are slightly different for some study to study. So the sample size, because some animals um, didn't behave that day at all. <laughs> they just either, um, did, we weren't able to utilize them for the open field maze at all, or we did have some animal, um, two animals um, to die, but that was in the later study. So all the animals are intact here. We did also a test using an elevated zero maze. And so this elevated zero maze takes advantage again of the fact that rodents, most rodents don't like to be exposed in the light and open air. 
but would prefer to be in a closed arm that is more secure and is darker, given that it has walls on both sides. And so we would put the animal in and for a given amount of time, see how much time they spent either in the open arm or the closed arm. Well, there was no difference in percentage or amount of time spent in closed or open arm. But what we did notice is that animals froze more if they were infected in the open arm. So what does that mean? So typically an animal, the mouse, and I'll do this so that those on Zoom can see as well, if they detect that a predator is nearby or they've associated a room or smell with the presence of a predator or a foot shock in the lab, they freeze their body. They put their four paws out and they just stand still like that. And that is a sign that they are expecting some adverse event to occur. And so we saw a higher amount of freezing behaviors in our infected animals compared to our uninfected ones. We also looked at sociability. Um, so we looked at social anxiety as well. So typically animal mice are very curious about a new mouse that they haven't seen before. And so we put in a box, um, what we call the animal zone, which had an, a mouse that was tethered so it couldn't move. And it was in an apparatus so that the two mice could see and smell each other, but they could never physically be in touch. So they would never fight. Uh, so we weren't worried about that. But it was a mouse that the animal was not familiar with because it wasn't in his home cage. And then in an equidistant part of the, the, the apparatus, we put a Lego block that was the same size and mass of, or approximate mass of the animal. So what did we see? We saw here, again, the y-axis is percentage of visits to the animal zone decreased in those that were infected, right? So they spent more of their time or more visits, greater percentage of their visits um, with the Lego versus the animal. We also looked at overall time in the object zone. And so the infected animals spent way more time investigating the Lego and very little time in the animal zone. And we can see that here as well. It took them longer. So when, if they did visit the animal zone, it took them much longer, higher latency compared to their uninfected counterparts. So in summary, through these different types of tests, um, I hope I have demonstrated there's evidence that indeed a latent infection produces these anxiety-like behaviors in rodents. That even when the, the scarring has healed from the acute infection, and I would just remind you that we didn't start behavioral tests until 45 days post-infection. Typically, it takes only 30 days for mice to enter the latent stage. So we worried it even two weeks longer than that. That indeed, there's a lifelong infection which leads to potentially lifelong behavioral impacts as well. And that's one of the things that we were beginning to do as COVID <laughs> began and as my job titles began to change. But we were interested to see how long lasting were these impacts in animal behavior after initial infection. Now, one thing to remember as we think about mechanism, again, those CD8 positive T cells are surrounding those sensory neurons that are infected, releasing, releasing cytotoxins that have been related to anxiety-like behaviors. And so perhaps it's through an immune mediator or mediators that actually prompt these behavioral changes in the host of the virus. So with that, I wanna thank you all for time. We have um, time for questions. Here's a list of the undergraduates that helped on this particular project that spanned a few years. I uh, want to thank funding both from Hope College as well as from the Department of Defense to help support this work and other pieces of work relating HSV-1 infection to proteins associated with Alzheimer's disease and other forms of dementia. So with that, I will say thank you and I'll take any of your queries.
Oh, sorry, that's the microphone coming through. <laughs> uh, would you expect the same responses from, for example, HSV2 or herpes zoster? That's a great question. So the different isoforms of herpes simplex virus or it's, you know, in the herpes family, the varicella or herpes zoster family. Um, I haven't seen any behavioral data on of those other viruses. The tricky thing about HSV2 is that it tends to prefer mucosal cells um, in terms of staying latent, that it tends to form the, to stay latent in the mucosal, or it tends to love, let me back up, it tends to like to be latent in the dorsal root ganglia. So we would have to change our route of administration or route of inoculation. Some people inject the virus into the foot pad, for example. And so that would probably be the preferred route to form latency there. But you're now a greater distance from the central nervous system. And so I don't know if it would be as quick to find these behavioral impacts or if it would be to such the same degree. Because remember, we infected in the eye. And so the trigeminal ganglia is only one synapse away from impacting the central nervous system. So any cytokines that might be released would just be more abundant quicker to the brain. But those say these cytokines do circulate. So perhaps if they do surround the dorsal root ganglia in the same manner, uh, which there is some evidence for it that to happen, then perhaps it could. Um, zoster is a bit trickier because its latency hasn't been associated with the same type of immune regulation. So we'd have to do further research to determine that one. Hi, I like to know about the uh, glycoprotein. You will have any uh, information on the sequence or the amino acids that's, that are present in this glycoprotein? Yes. So the um, great question about just how, like, what um, what amino acids are in the glycoproteins. Um, a pattern or the types of amino acids is not coming to mind right now of particular types, whether it be basic, acidic, et cetera. Um, I will say that the, the way the glycoproteins are structured allow it to bind to receptors, um, nectin, H-film. These are all receptors that we have in most of our epithelial cells. And so they bind quite readily. Um, so the glycoproteins are diverse enough. And so in the image, that I showed, they, they list three of them. There's almost, there's nearly 20 of these glycoproteins. And so it allows the virus to be quite nimble in binding to receptors to get into many different cell types for that acute infection. I've been reading the last few years about the impact of epigenetics on socialization. Mm -hmm. And this is a completely separate mechanism that affects socialization. Am I correct? Potentially, right. So we actually do know that while the herpes virus stays episomal, it does not integrate into the host chromosome, it actually can cause epigenetic changes ah, in the okay. host chromosome. So that, that is something potentially to study as well. Great question. Dr. Griffin, we have a question from a virtual oh, attendee. Yes. Sorry. Is curious, uh, in addition to herpes, are, have any other viruses been significantly tested uh, to determine their long term effects on behavior? Yes. So I would say, you know, we began to understand these links between infections and behavior. Um, we, could, we, look at, we look at polio, um, we, you know, we look at syphilis. Uh, we, uh, these are you know, foundational changes in behavior that are quite drastic, but again, prompted by a virus. Um, I mean, we could talk about COVID as well, uh, SARS-CoV-2. We do see actually impacts of long-term being a, a year now because that's the data that we have, but we do see changes in behavior as well. So there's a host of viruses um, 
from many different types, RNA viruses, DNA viruses, single-stranded, double-stranded, those that integrate in the host chromosome, those that don't, that tend to have profound effects on behavior. That was my question. Oh. <laughs> I'm curious if you've confirmed the latency because many of these effects, you put it in the cornea and then you have a light response mm -hmm. that, and so one could argue perhaps that the cornea itself is the problem. Yes, that's a great question. We actually did a test for visual acuity. Um, so allow them time to find a marble that was above it, their bedding. Um, one thing we did do, and this is in some of my supplemental slides here. Yes. So, uh, so the what you see here is a was graph with the result of quantitative PCR, where we looked at. Um, the, the, the amount of RNA, messenger RNA, of particular viral genes. And so the first one we have here on the y-axis is HSV1TK or thymidine kinase. This is one of the early genes, or this is one of the genes that we typically would be expressed during acute infection at high levels. And you see, you know, right after infection, high levels of HSV1 thymidine kinase about at day 30, you see that decrease and you see it stays decreased as well. Now, this taken with the next set of data, where we look at levels of LAT exon and LAT intron, LAT just stands for latency associated transcript. This is the part of the genome that actually is robustly expressed during latency and no other part of the genome is. Curious enough, it is the LAT exon, and if I had a whiteboard, I would do that, but essentially messenger RNA um, has components as it is replicated. And one of those components is called the exon. And the other one is called the intron. And what I tell my students, the intron is kind of like the interrupter. Lots of sequence, lots of talking, but actually doesn't mean anything. And so typically it's cleaved away and it's processed and digested very quickly. Whereas the exon typically is going to give the important part to make the protein after the messenger RNA does what it needs to do. Conversely, in herpes latency, what we see is the exon is not very stable. And so we see high levels of lat exon and intron early after infection. And we begin to start seeing, and you see the, the y-axis here are quite different, right? So a maxima of 600 for the exon, a maximum of 12,000 for the lat intron, and they're normalized to the same housekeeping gene uh, for quantitative comparison. But we see very low levels of the lat exon past day 30, whereas we <clears throat> see quite stable high, high levels comparatively of the lat intron. And this is the molecular definition of HSV1 latency. This is from the trigeminal ganglia of those mice. Um, and so that just want to, that's the way that we defined and verified latency. I'm wondering, we had one brother who was prone to getting cold sores, uh, fever busters, whatever you want to call them. Mm -hmm. But the rest of the family didn't seem to have that, be prone like that. Mm -hmm. Any, uh, anything to why that might be? Yes. So um, in addition to our genomes being different, our immune milieu is also quite different as well. And that is a combination of genetics, experience, exposures, the list goes on and on. And so that's one reason that we believe that there is such variance, not only of, I mean, so we see it now in COVID um, uh, prognosis, if you will, and in and impact symptomology, but also with HSV-1 in that we have some individuals that will have recurrent reactivations 
Um, and those that, again, as I noted earlier, that will get one cold sore and will never have one for the rest of their, their life. We are still don't fully understand that. Um, I would love to, or someone could do um, a mass study doing immune profiling of multiple individuals and see how that might correlate with these different reactivations or responses to different viruses. I need a little <clears throat> backup on um, the trigeminal. I'm thinking trigeminal nerve, but what exactly you're talking about the ganglion? Mm -hmm. Is that for the nerve, for the trigeminal nerve? It, it is. It is the where the host of the cell bodies, the nuclei are for that for that nerve. So the nerve is just the axon part, and so it's home base, if you will, the, where the nuclei are are in the trigeminal ganglia, and so that's the so the as we infect the eye, the virus does go up through the trigeminal nerve and then begins its and stays latent in the trigeminal ganglia. Okay, so I'm going to uh, use your method of hypotheses. Yes. Okay. So based on what you've presented, would it be fair to say, and this is real simple, when I have a cold sore, I should not make a deep thought decisions <laughs> definitely don't touch your eye um what i will say and some people you know say, oh I, I have a cold sore i just moved on i would really implore everyone you get the cold sore if sometimes you feel the tingling before it occurs put the abriva on there right away um because what you want to do is what i would suggest is you want to decrease replication because with every replication event, that means that that virus is leaving the neuron where it was latent and now is able to go to other cells. And yes, it will go back to the epithelial mucosal cells, but it potentially could also go to central nervous system neurons if it's close enough there. And what we know, right, it's as viral DNA goes into the central nervous system, it can have really drastic impacts, either acutely or long-term. So what others have shown in looking at post-mortem tissue data in humans is that those that succumbed with Alzheimer's disease had a higher viral load of HSV-1 in their brains. There should not be viral DNA in our brains, right? That means that there's been some being to make the blood-brain barrier more permeable than it should be, all right? We aren't seeing lots of macrophages there. We're not seeing lots of immune cells in those brain tissue, but we are seeing high amounts of HS1 viral DNA, and we don't know what it's doing there. Now, we don't know if it's active because no one has looked at proteins yet, but what we do see is that where you see high amounts of viral DNA, you also see high amounts of prion proteins, particularly looking at amyloid beta. And so the thought process is that perhaps amyloid beta is not a bad protein. It's gotten a bad rap, but perhaps it's a protein that actually protects uh, our brains from microbial infection. In fact, I can show you data from another project where we show that amyloid beta actually changes the structure of salmonella and how it kills it. And so that's just one thing to think about. So when you get the cold sore, I would just say, treat it, decrease replication, and then you can go into deep thought. <laughs> uh, could, could you describe, I'm sorry, one back there. Yeah. Uh, could you describe your, your next experimental step? What, what you would love to do? Mm -hmm. Yes, so we actually have tissue from the brain, from the spleen. We also have some plasma as well. And so I would love to complete some immune profiling in the infected and uninfected animals because I would love to see what if there are any immune differences because then that would help us get to a part of potential mechanisms of which cytokines or which immune factors may be the culprits in modulating these behavioral changes. And that was my question. Okay. What, what chemical do you think it is? Interferon, TNF, you know? Yeah. Um, some kind of cytokine process. Yeah, I, I, I think it could be, I think interferon could be quite um, 
the culprit, yeah. um, given some previous data in terms of behavior analysis, mm -hmm. but we have to see. Yeah, yeah. okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. We had another virtual question, Dr. Griffin, okay. briefly here. What studies have already taken place on COVID and its current effects on the brain? Yes, great question. So um, some work came out just a few weeks ago that was finally published and we saw, so now we're in the era of what we call preprints, right? So people are releasing their data before it is peer reviewed as a way to say, hey, this is coming on the press or hey, I'm laying my stake to this type of research. Or, you know, it also makes good for um, announcements on Twitter. <laughs> um, so one paper that I you know, was looking at the other day was they actually showing actually brain structural changes um, in light of COVID infection. And so, so that, that's one, you know, I think what we are also curious about or what is it doing to cellular morphology or cellular activation. Uh, and so I'm not aware of those studies uh, as of yet, but we do know that there are some structural changes induced by COVID and not even severe COVID. Mild to moderate COVID has been linked to actually structural changes in the cortex, right? And so this might be linked to long-term changes in smell and taste that some people experience, right? Oftentimes, people will use a peanut butter smell test as one of the indicators of dementia, particularly Alzheimer's disease. And so we know that there is some relationship um, to these cortical structures that are often impacted first in different types of dementia. As, as a brief follow-up, can you address the proliferation of pre-print uh, releases of, of academic <laughs> and scientific research? Yes, great question. So, um, when I was in graduate school, <laughs> it feels, I mean, was it too long ago, but it was a while. Um, you essentially would submit your manuscript and you would wait for it to be approved or you would have to most often do revisions and then um, submit it again, or you would go to a different journal or do more research and to it's finally accepted um, based on peer review. So sent to two or three of your peers that are, are familiar with the area of research that you're in. What has uh, taken hold the last couple of years is that there are these um, publications, if you will, or online sources for material that has not been peer reviewed. And so it is a, a pre-print. Uh, it is before it has been released by a certain press or magazine. And so they're saying, here's our manuscript with our data that we want people to see, um, and we will just make the disclaimer that it has not been peer reviewed. So it's not potentially in final form uh, or people have not given its credence yet. Now, another thing that has happened as well are these online journal systems where you submit your work and then it is up for public peer review. And so once you have a few peers uh, who they put their names and their CVs up to review your work and give it the thumbs up, then it's just automatically um, published. And so they say it has been peer reviewed. So it's a quick publication time, as well as most of these um, systems are open source. So scientists, uh, civilians all over the world can readily access them. Is there any record of prevalence as far as sex or age or anything like that? Yes. Social? Um, so typically the highest prevalence, uh, would be, you know, the kind of 20 to 50 year old age range, then it, it prevalence tends to go down. Um, once you get beyond 65, I believe it's the number. Um, if we look at, at sex, um, typically you see women, um, having a higher percentage of infective HSV1 than men. Curious enough, uh, Female species, uh, different organisms tend to exhibit a higher antibody titer response upon initial infection. And so that's just one curious thing as well in terms of we look at sex differences and this work has mostly been done in mice, but there's also some human literature as well with those self-reporting as women. So um, 
that's what we know so far in those those identity differences. Uh, hi, earlier you said about syphilis as a viral infection, but I understand syphilis actually came from spirochetes. Oh, right. Sorry, I misspoke. You're correct. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, you mentioned just a few moments ago the accelerated um, process of becoming published, if I can use that word. Mm -hmm. Are you 100% comfortable with that new way of? <laughs> um, it does have some advantages, um, you know, mainly the, the speed. You know, I think what at least what I experienced is there were lots of questions, particularly as new viruses, um, new infections emerge. And so people are just wanting answers. They're just wanting information. Um, and so that, I think that helped the proliferation of those types of domains. Um, the tricky part then is how much credence do you give to them, right? And so if you, if it hasn't been reviewed, you don't know if this has met the criteria in a certain field um, to have it meet certain standards. Um, so I think that is the tricky part. I think there, you know, of course, I'll use all the news journals that this, this hasn't been peer reviewed yet. And so it's that disclaimer, but without any other piece of information, that is what people were, were utilizing to inform their decisions of how to live their life in the, the quick pandemic that we found ourselves in. Um, so I think long-term, perhaps a mixture of different types of publications, we're gonna, we're gonna see them exist. I think if traditional journals find more and more ways to make information more accessible for people across the globe, just so that we can get a diversity of ideas and people that are actually focused on doing scientific work. I think that is a great advantage. I think it just has to be balanced uh, with credence. So, I mean, one suggestion I would give is that particularly people wait till they have a huge wealth of data to submit and say, well, this is one story. Well, oftentimes it's maybe two or three pieces. And so are there ways to kind of chunk the information um, so that we get data out more readily to people that we can have credence in because it doesn't take as long to review. Because what we saw during the beginning parts of COVID as well is that review time began to double and triple. And so you would submit your paper and instead of maybe waiting two or three months, you are now waiting six to eight months before you were hearing anything back from the journal. And so that does all of us a disservice. This is more of a comment, I think, though. You know, when you get published in JAMA or some credible source, then there's a way if the, it turns out that that wasn't true, yes. they tell you that, you yeah. know, or the New England Journal of Medicine or something like that. They'll say this since the study has been invalidated. Mm -hmm. And in this open, wild west of publications, yeah. people glom onto things that they want to believe, and you have two or three reviewers who maybe have a PhD, you know, or an MD, but they might still, frankly, be kind of quacks. And, and now it's like gospel for some people. Mm -hmm. And, and it's kind of hard to combat. Mm -hmm. And, and if we're going to have that kind of system, I think there has to be a public forum where people can be made aware that something has been stricken down. And of course, science knowledge changes all the time anyway. So what was true 20 years right. ago? I mean, look where you are now, right. you know, and I just think it's, it's, we need to have a better way of discerning what has been proven false, um, made public to the public at large. I, I find a lot of patients say, well, I read this on the internet. You're going, yes, yes, that's good that you're reading and I appreciate your seeking knowledge, but mm -hmm. it's not factual or has since been disproven. <laughs> yes, uh, you know, it's one thing that we are trying to increase the capacity of our students of um, not just data sifting, but also data critique, right? Yes. Of actually thinking about sources, mm -hmm. you know, how do you verify, what are you using to verify information? 
um, that is all right. Anyone can make a website and say whatever they really want to <laughs> nowadays. Um, so how how do you interrogate the information in a systematic manner that you can compare it as you move along as well? Mm -hmm. Thank you. We we've, we've seen the uh, getting away from publications. Mm -hmm. We've seen the uh, T cells surround cells we were studying. We also said that the uh, herpes could uh, go into the central nervous system. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if there is a parallel as the T cell reactions when the cell enters the uh, central nervous system compared with the activity with the peripheral cells. Um, okay, so basically what happens when the virus goes into the central nervous system and kind of other, do immune cells follow? Is that the, the question? Um, I haven't seen any evidence of that. Um, unfortunately, when HSV-1 enters the central nervous system, what we tend to see is herpes simplex encephalitis, right? Inflam inflammation of the brain that's due to the virus and that goes out of control. So if, so when virus, acute infection enters the central nervous system, you get uh, drastic neuronal loss. You get gliosis, which are the glial cells. They begin to replicate and surround the dying neurons. And so you get these large structures. Um, before um, acyclovir and other antivirals, uh, herpes sim simplex and encephalitis, if I remember correctly, had about an 80% fatality rate. Um, now, if you catch it early and give the antivirals, it has about a 20% fatality rate, which is still high. Uh, and those that do survive tend to have some type of neurological sequelae or some type of neural insult that they will that will persist for the rest of their lives. Um, and that is with high amounts of intravenous antivirals, which typically you can't keep people on for a high amount of time because it's damaging to their kidneys. So again, I try to tell people that yes, herpes for the most people in the world will not cause significant trouble. You know, this is part of you know, applying for grants. They say, well, why are you studying herpes? It doesn't do anything to people. Um, most people, right. Correct, um, but when it does, it is quite significant. Um, as well as we see more and more studies. If you were to, you know, Google this, um, more and more studies are coming out linking viral infection with dementia. Right. Uh, I remember presenting this research at Society for Neuroscience years ago, like 2014, 2013, no, 2013, 2014, and people are like, "Why are you, why are you studying this?" You know, you know, I told people, this is, this is what I want to go into. They said, well, good luck having a career, you know, because no one, and, and, and I wasn't the first to do this. So there's a group in Italy that also has various uh, evidence that supports the links between animal behavior and HSV-1 infection. Um, there was a subgroup started with um, some people in Philadelphia, a different institution, the Science Center in Philadelphia, that also had evidence of microbial infection. So we, I mean, so Parkinson's, for example, we also know that there's certain bacteria linked to the development of Parkinson's. You can see it in the brain. So it's these microbial infections that, yes, if we clear peripherally, we mostly are fine, but it's what happens Im immunologically what happens neuro neurologically in terms of shaping, altering behavior and disposition? We're just beginning to find that out. But thankfully now people are taking it very seriously in the scientific community. Is there much data kept on the prevalence of viruses by nations? We Yes, there's... Um, I believe the last name of the first author her is Aelo. Um, but there was a pretty, really good um, meta-analysis that looked at prevalence of HSV-1 across the globe. And you could see different percentages. Yes. Um, what about shingles? That yeah. virus. Yeah. yeah. So right, so chickenpox reactivated. Um, 
I haven't seen anything in terms of linking it to behavior. I mean, most of the work is focused on the severe pain that it does induce. Um, so again, the herpes viruses, they stay latent. Um, and most zoster, chicken pox, um, for, you know, for, me, for most, uh, goes latent and we never hear anything about it. Uh, and for some, it can actually re reactivate and cause pain and the patches and the dermatome. Um, there's, I think, different mechanisms perhaps of how that's happening and why it does impact others versus not impacting uh, different individuals. Uh, again, I think it's differences in these immune responsive profiles that we are beginning to seek out, right? So we had the genome first, then we had the proteome in terms of proteins. And as a neuroscientist, we talked about the connectome, right? So we could have a topography of how neurons are connected in our central nervous system, you know, and then soon I'm sure we will have this kind of immunome of whatever the word will be in terms of really the prevalence. And the thing is, this is going to always be constantly changing, right? Because as we experience different things, it's going to prompt um, how, what cytokines or what immune proteins or, or chemicals that are released and at what degree. Um, but we have to think about all these things in terms of, well, I got the same thing and it didn't impact me the same way. Yeah, because we have different immune profiles. Are you going to be discussing any more uh, regarding COVID-19 on Monday? I was one of the unfortunate people that got it in 2020 when they didn't have the vaccine. I was in the hospital for five days. Mm. I did totally lose my sense of smell and taste, which isn't a bad thing when you're in the hospital, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> but also, um, because it's in the brain, we have a few more senses in the brain. And my audiologist said, yes, he has had people come in and they have their hearing did deteriorate oh. after they had COVID. Okay. I've noticed that my eyesight deteriorated a little bit too. So I'm just wondering if you could give us an update on what they're saying about that. Okay. And then the dementia thing, that's kind of scary. So I'm going to give the microphone back. Okay. Yeah. Um, I haven't heard about the, the hearing or vision. So I'll have to look into that. Um, okay. Thank you. I, yeah, I, I mean, I think we are beginning to learn all of the, the ramifications. You know, I, I, um, so it's, it's still very early. Uh, right. <laughs> I'm going to thank Gerald and <laughs> make sure you know that we continue the class on Monday afternoon at one o'clock. So we look forward to okay. the continuation. Okay. This is this is different for us. Some of you, I thought it would be next Friday. No, it's next <laughs> Monday. Thank you. And let's just show Gerald our thanks for today. Okay. Thanks. Thank you all.